Hello everyone. Today is the 1st of April, 2021. I'm Roy Potter. Uh, I'm recording this now because I'm just not going to have any time to do it later, and I thought I'd better take care of it when I have the chance. Just because this is April 1st doesn't mean that I'm pulling an April Fool's joke. Uh, again, this is just the only opportunity I'm going to have to, to do this for a while. I promised that I was going to give some information on my understandings of the origins of Christianity and how I view Christianity generally. I'm not going to get into a lot of doctrine and dogma, but, but show you uh, why in my studies and experience, I've had to go down this particular path that I have. Uh, I don't mean to attack anybody's uh, faith or beliefs or religion or anything like that. Uh, everything is pretty much individual, and there will be people that will disagree with that. As a matter of fact, we've had 2,000 years of people arguing this thing, and it's, it's not right. But at the same time, when I get asked about how I view things, um, I figure that maybe, and I have, come out and explain some of it. I'm going to be talking about my book tonight uh, when we get there. Like I said, I'm going to read a little bit about uh, what's in here. This is the Crimson Thread. I wrote it, in, or I published it in 2006. Uh, it's a scholarly work, but I changed it into a novel form. And you'll see when I read the introduction, the scholarly aspect of it that's in there. But then I switched to a novel later because I thought it would be better that way to help people just kind of get into the story. Bottom line, I'm not a novelist, <laughs> so I'm not so sure I did a very good job there. But, I mean, considering, uh, uh, you know, okay, now we did that. Now, it's based upon a lot of study that I've done. Like I say, my entire religious, uh, spiritual background has to do with not just the Bible, but with history, uh, what happened, the other studies that I've made, etc., etc. And I had some mentors that helped me along the way. One was this gentleman here. He's a doctor of archaeology and history at the University of uh, California, Long Beach. And he is the world's foremost authority on the Dead Sea Scrolls, in my opinion. Now, you can talk about Vermes. That's that's another Dr. Vermes from uh, Oxford University. Um, he has his opinions, and there are others. And they ha and there there are disagreements in the scholarly community. Of course, I've talked about those before. Vermes is in the school that wanted to make the Dead Sea Scrolls go back during only the Maccabean period, so that they didn't have to explain what was going on in the in the Dead Sea Scrolls that had uh, applicability. <laughs> to the situation in the first century, dead on, dead ringer on. And it was Dr. Eisenman that pointed that out. And it was also Dr. Eisenman who suffered quite a great deal because he sued to get the Dead Sea Scrolls available to the public. So this is the man that you can thank for the Dead Sea Scrolls being available because the powers that be, I've talked about it before, the Bibliothèque Nationale, uh, the Israeli Antiquities Authorities, uh, even the Catholic Church didn't want uh, these these scrolls made public, especially if they could make the connection to events not just pre-first uh, century, but in the first century. And, of course, uh, Dr. Eisenman proved that, that they do. Uh, again, Vermes wanted to disagree with that. That's We're not going to get into that today, but I want you to know I'm aware of it. Uh, there are others like Dr. Price and Dr. Ruth Altman that agree with... Uh, Dr. Eisenman, and they also mentored me, and so uh, I, I rely a, a lot on their work, but also my own in this regard. So if you want to read, I've talked about this before, he wrote this book, he's actually written many books, The New Testament Code by Dr. Robert Eisenman. Uh, he also wrote James, the Brother of Jesus, which is probably a little easier read than this one. I don't know if either of these are still in print. Uh, James, the Brother of Jesus is an outstanding work, however, and it's very thick, just like this one. So, And he's written other books, as I've said, but I want, to, I want you to know that that's available to you. So before we get into my book, let me give you a little history uh, uh, here. I'll try not to get too complicated, but uh, I think it's something that you need to understand so that you know where I'm coming from. Let's start with Clementine. Clementine uh, was a traveler with uh, the Apostle Peter. 
And apparently he wrote some things down about what was going on uh, with Peter and, of course, with James and even Paul the Apostle, arguing with Paul the Apostle. I don't consider him an apostle by myself, Paul, uh, because it doesn't meet the definition in my, my understanding of things. But that, again, is another doctrine dogma thing that we probably can't get into here. It, you'll kind of get a glimpse of it, though, as we talk. So Clementine apparently wrote some things down. But all of those originals were apparently lost. At least we don't have them today. What did happen, uh, this is, we're talking about first century now during the life of, of Peter, okay, uh, the apostle. Uh, apparently there was an original manuscript of some sort. And as was very common in those days, they got copied. But they're not sure that there, if, if there even was anything from Clementine, uh, they're concerned that maybe this is pseudepigrapha into the point that it's uh, not wholly reliable, but it's still very close historically. It's in the first century, okay, so, uh, and, and early second century. So what we're looking at isn't the original Clementines. We're looking at what's called the pseudo-Clementines. And there's the, the Clementine, the pseudo-Clementine homilies and the pseudo-Clementine recognitions. These are two separate copies, apparently, of the original script from Clementine, and they differ very little. There are significant differences in some areas, but then they're almost exactly the same in others. So there's some significance that, that possibly it was written, uh, both of these, the homilies and the recognitions, were written from an original manuscript of some sort. What's the importance of the, the pseudo-Clementines? The importance is it shows my concern with James. My concern with James is not just because of uh, the Gospel of Thomas, uh, which is a Gnostic scripture. Not all the Gnostic scriptures are bad. The Gospel of Thomas is actually very good, as is the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of, of Philip, for instance. Uh, when you get into the hypostasis of the archons and that kind of stuff, it gets kind of out there. But, but again, that's beyond the scope of what we're doing here tonight. The Gospel of Thomas talked very much about Jesus saying that in all things go to James the just for whom heaven and earth were, were put into to place. Uh, so he really loved James, and it was to James that he actually gave his authority, and James became the, 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 the uh, bishop of Jerusalem. We know that from, from Josephus. We know it from the Clementines, the pseudo-Clementines, both the homilies and the recognitions. We know it from Irenaeus. Uh, also a, a second century historian about the same time as Origen, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, and uh, in, in this entire set of writings, there's a thing called the Ascent of James. And pointing out that James was the leader of, of the Jerusalem church, which, which also meant that he was, the, as I've explained before, the More Hadzetic, the teacher of righteousness in the Qumran Dead Sea community where the Dead Sea Scrolls were, were written. We, we see this tie-in, and James was actually the authority on first century uh, Christian origins, or what was happening. So if you can get back to James, you're really, really close to what was really going on. Uh, he, he was Jesus' brother. He walked with him. He talked with him. You know, he saw him you know, in the, in the Mount of Transfiguration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of these different things. And uh, so James is a critical figure. And because of that, when he wrote the Epistle of James, uh, the Council of Nicaea, which happened, you know, three centuries later, uh, they didn't want to include it in there because it was so much different. They actually had a problem with the Epistle of, of the, to the Hebrews, too, which was probably actually a manuscript written by James and maybe plagiarized by Paul, or it's an original of James. Well, it's hard to say, but there are things in there that are very similar uh, to what I'm going to talk about tonight as to why uh, I go down this road. So at any rate, James was the central figure. And because of his difference with Pauline Christianity, which became the popular notion of things later on, uh, there's been a lot of pejorative um, writings against uh, the Ascent of James, against the pseudo-Clementine pseudo recognitions, uh, even the, the Epistle of James, as I've said, and, the, and some issues brought up in the Gospel of, or the Epistle of the Hebrews, which I've talked about before, and again, I don't want to get bogged down too much tonight, but I wanted to t touch on that so that you know that there are early writings where I've studied these things and I understand their, how they interplay with each other and how they uh, connect. So we have that. Uh, 
other than Josephus and Pliny, and there are a few other minor things like uh, the, the, apparently there was a letter written by, by Pilate to Caesar. There's some questions as to whether it's for real or not, but most people say at least has good information in it. The real history that we are able to look at starts with Origen and Irenaeus in, uh, in about the mid-2nd century. So we're talking about right around 150 uh, AD, a little earlier than that for Origen, but, but basically that's what we're talking about. So they're very close to the events, okay? Um, as I've often told you, the Gospel of Mark wasn't even written, which is the first one that was written, apparently. It wasn't even written until 60 AD. So, and, and all of those original ones, in my opinion, were written in Hebrew. Uh, and I've talked about the reason why I believe that. And there are others that substantiate uh, my understanding of that as well, including Dr. Eisenman, by the way. So, you have Origen, uh, you have Irenaeus in about, you know, around the mid-2nd century, 150 AD, right in there. Uh, and then you have Epiphanius, and Epiphanius is the one who actually talks about the ascent of James, uh, which I just explained. And he's he's right around uh, mid third century uh, or so. And then we get into Saint Augustine and Saint Jerome and those guys, and we're now we're down third fourth centuries uh, away from the events uh, of of Jesus's lifetime. Not that their input isn't important. But and they certainly had access to some of the things that we don't today. But I, I still go back to the to the pseudo Clementines, to Origen and Irenaeus and um, uh, Josephus. So those, when you look at those and then you tie them into the Dead Sea Scrolls, which I have explained before, weren't just Maccabean time period. In other words, around 100 B.C. They were also written, they were writing them then, but they continued on until well into the first century, probably even after the destruction of the temple at 70 AD. And then, of course, that was the first Roman uh, revolt or revolt against Rome by the Jews. The second was the Bar Kokhba rebellion, or Kar Bar Kokhba rebellion. There's some questions as to which is which. Uh, it's probably the second, but at any rate. And... Uh, uh, that's when the Romans just totally decimated, d destroyed the Jews at that point in time. I mean, they did a good job in the first revolt and destruction of the temple and Masada and all that, but then there was even more that went on uh, there in 135 with Bar Kokhba. Uh, but at any rate, what we have here are events that, that, that we can substantiate uh, with Josephus, with Pliny, with Origen, uh, with Irenaeus, and... Uh, of course, those pseudo-Clementines, which I've talked about, which includes the ascent of James. So we, we come to that point, and then we go, as I said, to uh, later historians, uh, St. Augustine, St. Jerome, Epiphanes, etc. And then we get to the uh, Talmudic uh, Kabbalists and scholars of, the, of the, say, the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries in there, which is where uh, uh, the modern-day concept of Kabbalah comes from. Now, again, there are several different types of Kabbalah, but there's, there's some good information in those writings uh, if, you, if you can understand them. Uh, as I've said, Kabbalah uh, was, was actually uh, distilled I, I like to use that word distilled, <laughs> distilled from Hecalot, which was the earlier method of the prophets to, to, to prophesy and to approach the throne of God. I've talked about it before. Again, I don't want to get bogged down, but uh, Kabbalah in itself isn't bad. It just means to receive, and it's the study of the letters primarily and uh, the Hebrew words and uh, what, they, what they mean in their real basic um, bottom line meaning and how they contribute to the understanding of God and his plan. Uh, the the Kabbalists of the 14th century on practiced some really strange things. Not saying it was all wrong, but it was a lot of it was pushed by Talmudic Judaism, uh, which which has its problems. So uh, anything from 14th century on, as far as uh, Kabbalah is concerned, uh, I'm not into that. Okay, just so that you know, uh, I've looked at it. Uh, I understand a lot of it. I mean, I, a lot of the codes and things I don't, but I but the history and how it came about. I have a pretty good uh, handle on that, but the the other thing that we have to remember is is that uh, we have two councils that occurred early on uh, when the Jews were defeated after the Roman temple was uh, after the Jew Jewish temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. Uh, the Romans 
although they were good at assimilating other faiths, they had to have a change in Judaism. So at the Council of Yavna, Rabbinic Judaism, the true, what we know today as Rabbinic Judaism, specifically Talmudic Judaism, was born, and it got the okay from the Romans to do that. Uh, that should put up some red flags to folks <laughs> that they had to get, and, and that, that has carried on till today. Uh, the Kabbalists changed a little bit of that starting in the 14th century, but really that, that era right there with the Council of Yavna, which happened at about, uh, it was right after the turn of the, the first century into the second, right in there. It's actually about 90, uh, 90 AD, I think. But at any rate, uh, that was the first council, and they they had uh, some. They don't want to admit there were changes. I'm not saying they changed the Torah, but but they did uh, assimilate some other things out of the uh, Greco-Roman uh, concepts. Not many, but it was it's it's the way that they conducted their religious uh, lives that changed to to a great extent. Um, the other. A council that was important was the Council of Nicaea, of course, that most of you know about. And that's when uh, basically what we know is the Catholic Church got together and decided what books would go into the canon. It's not so much that they threw books out, it's that they didn't bring books in that they probably should have. Um, uh, the Book of Jasher, for instance, uh, the... Uh, uh, well, the Maccabees were included originally the, 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 in the Romans. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church did keep those even though the Protestants didn't. Um, and there were some other writings as well. Uh, but the one I want to concentrate on is the Epistle of James, because the Epistle of James was not based on what had become then the, the common core uh, doctrine of the church, which was the Pauline epistles. Uh, James was counter to that, and I've talked about it uh, a number of times, and it really comes down to the idea of, of, of grace. Um, yes, grace is legitimate, but James went a little further and said that doesn't re uh, relieve you of the responsibility to do good works because if you're following Christ, then you're going to do the works. That's And I talked about that a few days ago, about the, the concept of belief, that it means you're in the path, you're doing the path, okay? Um, so those were problems for for the Council of Nicaea. They didn't want James in there, the Epistle of James, but it, it ended up in there anyway. And then there was a problem also with the, the book, uh, the Epistle to the Hebrews, and I've talked about that a little bit too. I've read, for instance, uh, uh, Hebrews 1.3, etc., where it talks about Jesus uh, and his... his um, um, his struggles. Let me just put it that way. You can go read it again. I did a I did a, a video on it some time ago. So basically, what I'm getting down to is that there's a lot of history that I had to take into consideration, and this has been a 30 year, actually a 40 year study, and it could even be more than that. But in in trying to get the big picture, not just reading the Bible and and having questions, but actually getting down into the real scholarship so that I could understand uh, why and where I should go. I hope that gives you some background. It's really, really fast. I know it's not uh, probably making a lot of sense. I've thrown a lot of terms at you, a lot of names, but and I'm not trying to impress you. I'm just trying to tell you that this this was something that took me a long time. And there were, all, there were spiritual experiences. I will say that there are spiritual experiences that have occurred uh, that um, have helped me along the way. Okay, and everybody gets what they're able to. You know, not everybody gets the meat. You know, you have to get give milk before you can digest the meat, right? Okay, so with that background, let's talk a little bit about this book. Um, I wrote this as a result of all those studies uh, with with the assistance of my mentors, um, and I just leave it at that. I'm trying to save them some difficulties. But uh, I thought what I'd do is I'd start off and I'd, and I'd show you what, because this isn't available anymore. And it might be interesting to you. Now, this is going to be like reading a story, so I hope I don't bore anyone. If you don't want to hear this, because it's probably going to take us about 20 minutes, um, please feel free to, uh, you know, check out anytime you want. Okay. All right. This is Notable Reviews. Uh, the first one is from... Dr. Robert Eisman, author of James, Brother of Jesus, and this is what he says. Royston Potter's novel is the way one should go about approaching history in the first century in Palestine, and he does so in an imaginative, thought-provoking, and historically compelling manner. 
Since one is largely dealing with fictionalized romance except for Josephus, even at times Josephus, where the first century is concerned, fictionalized romance is the way to correct it, and Potter's experience as a colonel in the U.S. Army gives him an edge over others who are similarly trying to reconstruct the events of this period through the prism of the novel. With a practiced eye, he is able to peer through both the Gospels and Josephus and revive this period with more accuracy than others relying on folk and miracle-working wonder tales. Bringing to bear the precision provided by the Dead Sea Scrolls, he has brought to life a Gospel truth more incisive than previous more wide-eyed Neoplatonic forays. Choose it for your must-read list. And again, that was from Dr. Eisenman. Then this is from James A. Kirkwood, who is a Jewish rabbi Kabbalist. This is what he said. This book is an excellent window into the true spiritual and religious practices in Israel 2,000 years ago, including the impact the Hekelot, later the Kabbalah, had on events in history. Notice he said Hekelot first and then later Kabbalah, just as I have explained. He effectively negates the disinformation which has surrounded the official origins of what is now called Christianity, and he does so using historical events that he weaves into an exciting storyline with a master's touch, a superb and entertaining novel that clears the air. Uh, he was a little too uh, congratulatory there, too, a little too, uh, he was giving me too much of a comment by saying I... I, I Weaved it into an exciting storyline with a master's touch. I wouldn't say that, but it was nice of him to give me that review. Okay, uh, then let's go ahead and let's read the introduction. And again, this might take some time, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to do this like a lecture. Okay, so uh, let's see what happens. All right. The man... The man, legend, or concept known as Jesus can be found in ancient texts long before the New Testament was written. In Old Testament characters, parts and elements found in various so-called pagan mythologies, principles heralded by Greek philosophers, evidences presented by scholars, newfangled interpretations, and outright lies. With all the disinformation, sacred cows, and reputations at stake, the whole truth is probably lost forever corrupted like so many of man's other endeavors. Likewise, my effort cannot be judged as anything less or more than those before me. But there is one difference. I wrote this book and its sequels to force me to study the issues in detail and arrive at the most reasonable answer given what facts are available, and try to balance the rest. One does not challenge the fundamental concepts of a world religion without serious reflection, considerations of moral responsibility, a sense of vulnerability, and raw, naked awe at the revelation of the magnitude of the project. This story is based on historical facts and events which have been ignored or lost to us over the centuries. Academics and researchers have long known of these issues, but I know a few, if any, who have placed them in a, into a readable story. The events of history in the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago impact our perceptions and loyalties even today. The fact must be considered, that fact must be considered when evaluating the actual circumstances of the birth of a new religion around the efforts of Jewish patriots to free themselves from tyranny. The name of the game was liberation from oppression, the independence of Israel and its survival as a nation people, and the guarantee of individual dignity and liberty. The revolt against Rome, for that is what it was, was led by a number of aspiring liberators. The greatest of these liberators taught the idea of the freedom of the individual combined with what modern psychiatry identifies as logotherapy. And I give a reference to that. Not the prescription of blind acceptance or feel-good spiritualism. He taught that any requirement to obey a dogma, no matter how well-meaning, was unrighteous force. While all peoples fashion their gods after the understanding of their own hearts, any attempt to force that image on others upon some pain of retribution or vengeance does not fit in with the need for the right to discover truth for oneself. This is admittedly contrary to the way this story has been handed down through the millennia. History shows us there were many saviors, quote-unquote, at the time in history we are presenting, from the pagan god myths of Mithra and Dionysus to the historically verifiable Hebrew Messiah claimants beginning with Yeshu ben Pendira through Judas of Sephoris, Athrangus, 
Judas the Galilean, and even Simon bar Kokhba, as late as 135 CE. And you could throw in there Simon Magus, too, for that matter, if any of you know the New Testament. To name a few, there has hardly ever been a time without someone trying to fit the profile and lay claim to the title. The historian Josephus even named, listen to this, the historian Josephus even named the then soon-to-be Emperor Vespasian as the promised Messiah from Judea. The, the fact is, many peoples, if not all of them, have a legend of some man-god who saves mankind from himself. Whether it is a collective subconscious hope or a teaching of the ancients assimilated into every culture and tongue according to their understandings, the fact is, it exists. The extant existence of this hope, especially amongst the so-called pagans, seems to me to be more of a revelation of the validity of this hope, rather than distraction from it. But this brings us to a more plausible explanation of the legend, not of a God-man, but a man accepted by God because of his works and faithfulness. Now, what I didn't tell you about, and I meant to, was the Ebionites. Uh, Jacob, or who is we know as James, um, in his ascent of James that was uh, talked about by Epiphanius, uh, is looked at pejoratively uh, about the origins of the church. Uh, basically, anybody from 300 AD on looked at uh, the ascent of James and the Ebionites uh, pejoratively. The Ebionites were the Essenes, basically, uh, the Nazarenes who inhabited Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls came from. Again, we're going back to trying to hide the true origins of Christianity, and that's why there's a pejorative against James and the Ebionites. Ebionites means the poor. Didn't Jesus use that term, you know, the poor? Yeah, the poor and the meek shall inherit the earth, etc. Not meaning poor that you don't have belongings, but that, that you're put down by society, that kind of a thing. <clears throat> Perhaps it is most likely a blueprint, if you will, for each individual. The truth is not done for you, you do it for yourself. You are the one ultimately, ultimately responsible. The greatest gift to us is our unquenchable thirst for answers, and no one has the right to inhibit honest inquiry and experimentation inherent with that as long as we do not interfere with the rights of others. Who really knows the absolute truth? usually, as history proves, not those who proclaim they do. Often, it is an individual struggle, rewarded with the awe of discovery that brings with it true conversion, not blind obeisance for mere survival. As one of my former teachers put it, the man Jesus was the first to realize the benefits of his religion for himself. The premise of the story I present here is based on a family that was steeped in Judean and Galilean resistance to the Katim, which is Hebrew for foreign invaders or usurpers, the time and reference occupied by, the, by Rome and the Herodians. This family appears to provide the central figures of the revolt against Rome, and their names are shown not only in the New Testament, but in other references as well, and I've already discussed those. The distortions concerning these individuals resulted from the fog of history, as well as the deliberate attempts by those who saw this information as somehow damaging to their theology or political control. Evidence, evidence of this can be seen in the historian Josephus's works, where the period we are discussing basically takes up only four pages in his Antiquities of the Jews, and little over two in his Wars of the Jews. By contrast, a similar period during Herod's reign took 53 pages in the Antiquities alone. Explanations for this abound, but none are satisfactory. Either someone, hopefully not Josephus, omitted the material concerning the time frame in question, or Josephus was a party to the subterfuge, a possibility given his position with the Roman Flavian imperial family. Those who supposedly wrote the Gospels under such names as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and others were likely decades removed from the real events as were many of the historians of the period. I just explained all of that. The truth of the matter sadly is lost, but one need only see the modern world to recognize what happened. The winners write history. Who won? The Romans. Fortunately, they frequently forget to erase all the details or completely cover the evidence of what they desired to destroy. All one need do is have the courage to look to find the truth, 
like a criminal investigation, the truth is only a matter of the evidence left behind. Do we have the courage to reveal it and call it what it is? Another factor that can partially explain the historical scriptural discrepancies is the recognition that the major events described in the New Testament actually occurred at least 10 to 15 years prior to the dates traditionally accepted. For instance, the historian Eusebius and the Acti Pilati, mentioned by Epiphanius, placed the start of Pontius Pilate's rule in about 19 CE, 19 BC. This is a full seven years earlier than alluded to in Josephus and the Gospel chronologies. But the most significant evidence of a calendar discrepancy is in the New Testament itself. Luke 2, 1 to 2, states, quote, In those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, and this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria, unquote. It is subsequent to this tax, as explained by Luke, that Jesus was born. But Matthew 2.2 2 has Jesus being born during the last days of King Herod. The problem is that King Herod died in 4 BCE. The tax of Serenius was not until 6 CE, 6 AD. So the death of Herod was 4 BC. The tax of Serenius was 6 AD. Here is at least a 10-year difference it is likely that the person we know as Jesus may actually have been born as early as 15 B.C., and Epiphanius places it even earlier, at around 35 B.C. With the calculation, listen to this, with the calculation that James, Jesus' brother, was 96 when he was martyred in 62 C.E., 62 A.D., Many have tried to explain this discrepancy away with the possibility that Luke was referring to another tax altogether, but there is no historical evidence of such an event. The end result is that the chronologies of the New Testament are in serious question, as are Josephus's, and it could have been an inadvertent error because of the lapse of time or a deliberate attempt by others to distort the facts for their own purposes. In fact, what was born amongst the Jews in Judea and Galilee in 6 CE, in direct opposition to the tax, was what Josephus called the fourth philosophy, innovators, a zealot messianic movement that held inviolable the principle of liberty and the right to repel tyranny and oppression. These principles are at the very heart of a leap in consciousness that would enable mankind, despite efforts by the powerful to suppress them, to envision a world where the individuality and freedom of the soul, of the individual, was as important, or more so, than the government or the nation-state. Indeed, as stated in the Gospels, they envisioned a kingdom not of this world, meaning the world of Caesar and tyranny in general. The original books depicting the efforts of these people were written by and for the Jews who lived in those times and knew the law or Torah teachings, where we generally do not. Living under oppressive occupation, they often wrote in symbolism and parable to try and convey ideas, not the history of a real person per se. Look at what we have to do today on social media. We can't say certain terms. We have to use stories or or different words to convey the meanings that's what he's talking about that's what i'm talking about here what do these recognitions accomplish for us historical events of the messianic movement that seem removed from new testament time periods now are likely simultaneous events with the lives of those people we recognize jesus john the baptist james jude etc in other words, the characters of the revolt against Rome from 10 B.C. to 70 A.D. are likely the same people who figure so prominently in the New Testament under another storyline that deliberately and incorrectly removes them from any political activity. Regardless, the evidence that survives appears to show that at around 20 B.C. to 35 A.D., there was a real man whose true character and intentions were lost to us through time and history, thanks to opportunists and liars who desired, for their own purposes, to build one of the greatest frauds ever perpetrated on the world. I told you this would get pretty heavy. 
Listen carefully now. The man known as most of us, to most of us as Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was first and foremost a Jew. More appropriately, a renewed Israelite, dedicated to the law of Israel. He worshipped and lived his life in that context. Also, he was not from Nazareth, as it is unlikely such a place existed at the time. But he apparently was a Nazarene or Nazarite, referring to specific oaths he had taken much like the Essenes. And oaths is probably a bad term because they don't take oaths. It would be promises. In other words, making covenants. You do this, I do this. God, you do this, and I'll do this. Okay. And of course, his name was not Jesus, which is the Greek rendition of the Hebrew name Yeshua. Actually, it's Yehoshua. Even the name Yeshua, in this case, was likely only an appellation of identification of purpose or calling, meaning one who saves. His mission took place in the environment and culture of the times, especially those of his national and spiritual roots, and he cannot be understood outside of them. From the subtle evidence available, he attempted to obey what we know as the Old Testament, the Torah, especially the fi first five books called the Pentateuch, or Torah. He is credited as saying that with him the law, Torah, was fulfilled, or in other words, he did it exactly, not that he, 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 he did away with it, Fulfilling meaning he did it exactly. He filled it up. He walked the path. He did not eradicate it, change it, or modify it, but instead stated that no point of the law, quote, not one jot or tittle could be taken away. If anyone did so and taught others to disobey it, that person would be the least in the kingdom of heaven. There are no more authentic words in the New Testament than these. But he was not a fanatic either. He disdained efforts to interpret the law to say more than the scripture intended, and he refused to require unswerving devotion to some brand of interpretation of Torah beyond its own framework. Therefore, there is evidence that he found his spiritual path in the mystical hekelot, meaning chambers, and this later became known as Kabbalah, meaning to receive, and not so much in the literalist philosophy or even the Pharisaic interpretations passed down as the oral Torah. Also, he undoubtedly rejected the foreign occupation of Palestine. This put him at odds with the Greco-Roman empires and the puppet rulers and collaborators. All the indications show that he did not approve of the Roman system, especially its despotic rule over Judea, Galilee, and the nation of Israel. However, he did not dislike Romans, if the reader will see the difference. While maintaining a separation, meaning holiness, from those of the world who ate meat sacrificed to idols, slept with women in their periods, or otherwise polluted the temple. Those are all Ebionite terms, all Dead Sea Scroll terms. And they're in the New Testament as well. He believed, I am certain, in attempting to understand the whole condition of mankind and offer them a chance to discover the truth on their own, even though he recognized his mission was to his own people, Israel. He took to heart the prayer of the 70 nations of the world offered by the high priest of Israel. He lived as a man with all the responsibilities, rights, joys, and concerns that condition brings to any man. He was also confronted with the greatest of contradictions, yet did not turn away from investigating them, nor did he proceed with an invocation to dogma. He studied the heights and depths of every subject, a characteristic that may have branded him a backslider by those closest to him. As a result, he experienced difficulty at the hands of his family and friends, something common in life. All the while trusting in a power superior to his own, and without a great deal more than the hope that what he stood for was not just his own will or a figment of his imagination, and he did it without falling short of the mark. He lived the Torah exactly, neither adding to it nor diminishing from it. I want to go back to here where it says, as a result, he experienced difficulty, all the while trusting in a power superior to his own and without a great deal more than the hope that what he stood for was not just his own will or figment of his imagination. Go read Hebrews again, where it describes him agonizing and wanting God to save him. Since that time, various religions, governments, and sects have tried to structure history from faith and impose it upon us as immutable fact. We must examine, with particular demands on reason, all aspects of the evidence if we are to be honest with ourselves. 
One point in Christian scripture seems to make sense given our place in the world and the chance, albeit a small one, to become something greater than we are. If the self-appointed Apostle Paul said anything of value, it was that we are to be joint heirs with Christ. I've talked about that a lot. Meaning we cannot make the Creator anthropomorphic, but it seems obvious that the Creator has provided us a path to achieve a higher level of understanding, to take some of the Creator's attributes onto ourselves. A most important aspect of that character is to look for the truth. As one author put it, to put dogma above truth is no way to honor God. This is the story of the beginning of that consciousness which would cause the great kingdoms of the earth to tremble. I might interject here, what are they trying to do to us now? They know that this swelling of liberty is in our hearts, this gospel, and they're trying to destroy it. They're trying to keep us from joining together. They're trying to keep, put us down to, to, to humiliate mankind. <laughs> Same game plan. Let me start that again. This is the story of the beginning of that consciousness which would cause the great kingdoms of the earth to tremble. The empires and governments of the world, the rich and powerful rulers over the common man, saw a vision of their own demise and the rising of the people to new levels of realization. During and beyond the events of this book, the great powers of the world would use highly refined systems of fear and manipulation to hide the truth of these events from subsequent generations and seek to suppress the swelling of liberty in the hearts of individuals over whom they held power. The Roman Empire, the Inquisition, and even on to the present day, the powerful try to manipulate and control the masses using a potent mixture of religiosity, superstition, and fear. But the truth whispers to our consciousness like the remembrance of a son for a father. Will we listen? For most of my life, I have studied numerous religions and spiritual paths, particularly Israelite culture and tradition. Most fascinating and enlightening, in my view, are the Torah, along with its rabbinical interpretive techniques and the mystical Kabbalah. This story is the reason... Now, I'm not talking about Aleister Crowley's or even the Kabbalah of the 14th century onward, okay? Not the same thing. This story is the result of that most rewarding journey. I must, however, however, emphasize that this is a story, a novel. It is based on historical and religious research, but it is still a novel. <laughs> I found it necessary to use some of the esoteric language of the people in this period, and that may become awkward for the reader. Where possible, I have defined the terms and conditions. Often, however, I could not. I am not a master of these traditions and techniques. I am merely aware that they exist and played an important part in history. Hopefully those who find these things of interest or value will search them out on their own. So what I can promise here is that I have attempted to keep the story within the framework of historical believability and scriptural law that our most dedicated man represented in today's world as Jesus Christ would surely manifest in his life in every way. While this fictionalized account may appear primarily conjecture, it is no more so than the versions handed down through the centuries by theocratic and political leaders. This depiction of the man we know as Jesus does not diminished from his purpose or his contributions to the spiritual advancement of mankind. What it does do is de-Romanize the mission of Jesus and returns his story to its Jewish origins. The message of his life and his example is that the kingdom of heaven is reached, not through the auspices or approval of any man or organization, but only through a personal relationship with the Creator and individual spiritual advancement. Therefore, it is not and cannot be bestowed upon one without warrant. If one only follows in his footsteps and obeys the law and the testimony, the individual can indeed find his way to the throne of glory. In this book, the reader will discover the humanity and the true spirituality of the man called Hamashiach. In his story is the hope of individual freedom and its cost along with the realization that our condition is the basic blueprint for approaching the divine. I'll read the prologue, too. That was the introduction. I'll go ahead and read the prologue. Another five minutes. Can you hang on? Prologue. The world is at war. Any nation or people who will not bow down to the Western Empire, Rome, 
is crushed, destroyed, or absorbed. Under the guise of restoring liberty to the oppressed, a tyrant justifies his expansions and influence. Sound familiar in today's world? Quote, this is the tyrant talking, We know what is best for you, and that we intend to force upon you under the pain of death or economic destruction. You have the right to choose our way. Any other is contrary to the will of your people. We are the great republic turned empire, overseen by our beneficent emperor." Unquote. It is the period of 50 BC to 35 AD, and the Roman Empire has swallowed the Western world and secured its usurpation of the trade routes to the East. It was all necessary for the national security and the freedoms of the people of Rome. In the wake of the onslaught, millions of people are killed and enslaved, and whole peoples are victims of mass genocide. To ensure control, the Romans have placed their own rulers over the lands they conquer. These rulers are not selected by the local people or by their traditions. The rulers are foreigners and traitors appointed by Caesar. In Caesar's name, these rulers plunder the land, kill or imprison their detractors, and incite the people with contrived disturbances to further justify their presence. False flags. They offer a false security in exchange for the people's acquiescence. Opposing these invaders and usurpers is a group of patriots who do not want to accept the invitation to the Pax Romana. Like all those who want to determine their own course, a number of their brave join ranks and seek to expel the invaders, even at the peril of the loss of their fortunes, families, and lives. Their own system of government had worked for them, and if they had had tyrants in their system, and they had, well, they were their tyrants, and they would deal with them accordingly. The rulers put in by the invaders are not of the people's choosing, and despite all claims to the contrary, offer no abiding guarantees of good and righteous government. The people conquered by this irresistible force do not lightly accept their fate and know that the real reason for the presence of the invader is robbery of their resources, of their lone lands, and religious treasures. Again, here we are today. This is the seedbed of the Jewish resistance against Rome. They do not assent to Roman occupation or rule and are fierce in the defense of their land. Their leaders are Kepha, Judas the Sicariot, Simon Magus, Eliezer, Jacob, Yosef, and even Jesus or Yeshua, the Messianic King. They rise in defiance of the Roman war machine and out of respect for the traditions of their fathers. Their God is the God of their fathers, and they have sworn not to place any man or thing ahead of this deity. To those who listen to the heroes of Judea and Galilee, they hear their plea. Quote, Seek for the truth, and the truth will make you free. Unquote. Yet, in the midst of this maelstrom stand two men, brothers, who trace their lineage from King David. They both lay claim to the throne of Israel, and neither will surrender to the other. The outcome of this rival, rivalry may decide the fate of Israel and all history. This is their story and ours. Long session here. And I didn't touch everything like I'd like to. You never do. But it was off the cuff. As you can tell, I didn't use any notes. Except for when I read my book. It's been a long journey. I don't expect just anybody to do it. Sometimes, as I've said, simple faith is best. But if you have a yearning for the whole story, as Paul Harvey would say, and that's the rest of the story, if you want that, you'll search these things out. So that should explain some of the things I've said in the past. And there's more, of course. But that hopefully will explain at least some of it. Okay, well, I guess that'll be it. And uh, maybe we'll have a live stream on this subject after this is up uh, for a few days. Um, and I'm done with my other works that I've got to do. Uh, maybe we can have a live stream and discuss some of this. Yeah, our, our country and the world is in a lot of trouble right now. But 
if we turn our, our, our minds at least some of the time to some of these really important issues about our about who we are, where we come from, where we're going, salvation, etc. Uh, it it kind of gives us an anchor, even if it's not quite the way you think it should sound because of your particular faith. At least you'll understand that that you know I'm looking at you know the whole big picture. Okay. All right. Well, that's all I got. You all have a great night. Out for now.